For the last several weeks of the course, we'll be examining the archaeology of South America, particularly Western South America and the Peruvian coast. For a variety of historical, geographical, and scientific reasons, this region is less well known than either the eastern woodlands of North America or Mexico and Mesoamerica. There are also fewer good introductory texts written about South American archaeology. Mosley's textbook is consequently a bit more expert-oriented than your other texts. While it may be a bit more dry and technical, the information is good. Bear with it and read carefully and you'll have no problems. Since we're starting in the middle of the book, Mosley will also use special terminology to find earlier in the text. Make use of the index at the back of the book to find where those ideas are defined. As usual, let's begin by looking at the geography of the region, because geography plays a major role in how cultures develop. This part of South America is dominated by the Andean Cordillera, a long chain of extremely high and rugged mountains and highlands. They parallel the Pacific coast of South America, only a few miles inland, for thousands of miles from north to south. It is because of the extreme height and length of the Andes that the Peruvian environment takes on the form that it does. This region is south of the equator, for the most part, and within the tropical zone. Prevailing weather patterns flow from east to west across the massive expanse of the Amazonian rainforest. In this warm, humid environment, air masses pick up huge amounts of water. But as they run up against the eastern side of the Andes, the air must rise over the mountains. In doing so, it cools, and cool air can hold less moisture. Thus, the eastern side of the Andes is dominated by rainforests and plentiful rainfall. On the other hand, after air masses finally climb above the Andes and begin to descend on the western side, they no longer have any moisture available for rain. Thus, the west coast of South America is one of the most profoundly dry deserts on the planet. The average annual rainfall in the Atacama Desert, part of the western South America, is only 15 millimeters per year, less than one inch. This phenomenon, wet rainforests on one side of the mountains and dry deserts on the other, is known as a rain shadow. The geography of Peru is thus broken into three broad regions, all running parallel to one another from north to south. In the east is the tropical rainforest, hot, wet, and overgrown with vegetation. In the middle are the Andes Mountains themselves, high, cold, and dry, but still getting some moisture. In the west, along the coast, are low coastal deserts with very little moisture at all. Each of these three zones developed distinct uh, cultural adaptations to living in their respective environments. Mosley refers to these adaptations as tropical forest, arid montane, and maritime oasis, respectively. Each represents a broad pattern of culture shared across a large geographical area. On the other hand, because the local geography of a particular valley or mountain could greatly impact conditions, each adaptational zone also encompassed great variation. More so than either North America or Mesoamerica, South America is a land of ethnic diversity. The arid montane adaptation combined high-altitude agriculture with even higher-altitude herding. The Andes were the only region of the New World to domesticate large-bodied livestock in the form of llamas a relative of the camel native to very high mountain pastures. The combination of farming and herding was only possible because of the steep slopes and rugged terrain of the mountains. A short journey would take one up or down the mountain into markedly different environments. Thus, a family could build a farmstead at one location, move down the mountain to farm in warmer temperatures, and then climb up past where crops could grow to pasture their llamas in the natural scrub grass. In less rugged terrain, these different environments would be too far apart for a mixed strategy to be practical. On the other hand, in the mountains, a more specialized strategy would not produce enough food to feed the population. Along the coast, cultures were organized according to Mosley's maritime oasis adaptation. The deserts were crossed from east to west by many short, shallow rivers that drained the little water falling west of the Andes. Other than in those na narrow valleys, water was not available. Farmers thus clustered in the valleys around these oases and seldom moved north or south into other valleys. The areas in between were all but uninhabited. At the mouths of these river valleys, rather than farming, people lived as fisherfolk. 
The Pacific coast of South America is one of the most productive fisheries in the world, making this strategy very attractive. However, one cannot be both a farmer and a fisherman. Fields must be too far from the coast to avoid contamination from salty groundwater, and both jobs require most of the day to be productive. Thus, while communities in the highlands combined both farming and herding, along the coast each community chose one strategy to specialize in. But specialization has the side effect of limiting one's access to the goods and products produced by other strategies. So trade along the coast was more developed than in the highlands, as each community sought to provide itself with the goods and resources that it did not produce on its own. Meanwhile, on the eastern side of the Andes, Amazonian lifestyles dominated. Lowland agriculture in the plentifully watered land, with hunting at higher elevations, and fishing in the many streams and rivers. Andean urban civilization never spread into this area, perhaps because environmentally it was so radically different from the other zones. These different strategies evolved very early in Andean history, and continued largely unchanged throughout prehistory and up to the time of contact. As comparatively little archaeological work has been done in South America, the cultural chronology there is less well known than elsewhere in the New World, but these reflect the most important cultural periods and dates. The lithic and pre-ceramic period, beginning around 15,000 BC to 1800 BC, is followed by the initial period from 1800 to 900 BC. The early horizon then picks up at 900 BC and lasts until 200 BC, and is followed by the early intermediate period from 200 BC to AD 600. Next is the middle horizon from AD 600 to AD 1000, then the late intermediate period from AD 1000 to 1476, and finally the late horizon, also called the Inca Empire, from 1476 to 1534, when Spanish conquistadors arrived in Peru. Many of the same sorts of cultural developments we saw in the North American and Mesoamerican archaic periods also occurred in South America during the lithic and pre-ceramic periods. During the initial period, some of the earliest urban centers in the New World rose up along the Peruvian coast, but these remained small and isolated. It wasn't until the early horizon that widespread patterns of civilization could be seen across large geographic areas. For the remainder of this lecture, we'll look at civilizations of the early horizon and early intermediate period. Next week we'll examine the middle horizon and late intermediate period, and in two weeks we'll look at the Inca Empire. Today, we know that urban centers had been found throughout the Peruvian region for centuries before the early horizon, but for many years, the first major fluorescence of Andean civilization was considered to be the Chavin culture that first appeared in the last few centuries before the modern era. In the northern part of Peru, the early horizon is defined by the appearance of Chavin cultural artifacts. While it was not the first Andean civilization, it was certainly the ver first very widespread and influential civilization, and one whose influence we can trace for centuries through dozens of later cultural traditions. Chavin de Huantar, the major center and origin place of this cultural tradition, is located in the highlands opposite the central Peruvian coast, a little north of the center line of the culture area. It was first settled about 800 BC, and seems to have been the center of an expansive religious cult rather than the seat of a territorial state. Around 400 BC, its temples began to be expanded and redesigned, and artistic styles associated with Chavin began being made throughout the northern half of Peru. At this time, the site reached its largest population in size, covering 42 hectares, but with only a few thousand residents. Scholars did not believe that Chavin de Huantar ever established political dominion over the Andes, but rather that the religious cult centered there became so influential that its very presence unified and integrated the northern Andes culturally for centuries. The center of the cult was a massive stone temple complex, today known as the Castillo. This complex, built and expanded over the centuries, was different from many Andean temple complexes in that it had internal architecture. Many Andean holy sites, from the earliest time to the latest, were solid mounds of stone or adobe, on the top platform of which ceremonies were conducted or small temples built. 
The Castillo, on the other hand, has many internal passages and features, all of them carefully engineered to control the experiences of worshippers and to produce supernatural effects. Internal drains and echo chambers would make the temple roar when rain fell, and priests could miraculously appear from hidden doorways. But the centerpiece of the temple was the Lanzon, a 4.5 meter tall stone stela, or without the jargon, a carved stone. In the deepest chamber of the temple, the Lanzon was carved to represent the Shavin deity, sometimes referred to today as the Snarling God. This fearsome deity combined human and feline features, its teeth drawn back in a dangerous-looking snarl. The Lanzon's base was buried below the floor of the chamber, and it loomed so large that its top rose through an opening in the ceiling to the level above. A special hatch in the ceiling allowed a hidden priest in the chamber above to speak for the god, creating the sense that the massive stone beast was aware and active. No wonder the Andean peoples became so devoted to this cult. But no religious tradition can enjoy such widespread popularity for centuries without evolving itself. The Lanzon suggests that the early Shavin cult saw its deity as an oracular deity, answering questions and giving advice to its supplicants. But later in the cult, the Raimondi stila, another carved stone image, approached the deity from a very different manner. The Raimondi stila shows the same snarling human feline face, but rather than speaking, it is now holding two staffs, one in each hand. This staff god motif became popular throughout the Shavin sphere of influence, and can be traced for centuries in other cultures' iconography. Scholars believe this image depicts the Shavin god as uniting the human and supernatural worlds, one represented by each staff. The Shavin cult dates back to perhaps 800 BC, and it spread most widely through northern and coastal Peru between about 400 and 200 BC. This same time frame marks a period of drought and agricultural shortfalls throughout the region. It isn't clear whether the cult spread through missionaries being sent out from Shavin, or pilgrims coming to the site, but in either case the cult promoted mobility and movement throughout the region. This movement no doubt facilitated trade that lessened some of these subsistence shortfalls, while the religion itself comforted the worshippers. Unfortunately, that means that when the drought ended about 200 BC and crops were once again relatively plentiful, the cult lost influence. Shavin waned and was eventually abandoned. The next major unifying force of Peruvian civilization would be decidedly more secular in nature. The early intermediate period begins about 200 BC, and after several generations of good rainfall and plentiful crops, around the time of Christ, another drought hit the north coast of Peru. About AD 100, this drought led to the emergence of the first major coastal civilization in the region, the Moche. The Moche civilization was centered in the Moche Valley and spread to dominate most of the north coast. Parts of the civilization lasted until about A.D. 750, though in many places the culture had burnt out by 600. Moche civilization was centered at the city of Cerro Blanco, in the Moche Valley. Scholars debate whether the entirety of the Moche region was a single centralized state, but it is certain that Cerro Blanco was the capital of a large, powerful kingdom. The degree to which Moche cities and other valleys were under its direct control is still questioned, however. Cerro Blanco was dominated by two massive adobe mounds, sometimes called pyramids, though neither has the square base typical of other pyramids. The larger of the two is Huaca del Sol, the Pyramid of the Sun, just like the largest pyramid at Teotihuacan, far to the north. It measures 340 meters by 160 meters, and at its highest point rises 40 meters above the surrounding landscape. It originally had a cross-shaped footprint and four separate terraces. Unfortunately, colonial Spanish treasure hunters diverted a nearby river to undercut and wash away over half of the mound. They could then just fish the valuable artifacts in the water. From the evidence left to us, the Huaca del Sol seems to have served a dual purpose for the Moche state. It was the residence of their highest leader, or leaders, and the center of their government bureaucracy. 
It also served as the tombs of past leaders, though it was those very tombs that led the Spanish to destroy the mound in the first place. The Huaca de la Luna, the Pyramid of the Moon, is the other major mound at Cerro Blanco, and this appears to have served primarily as a temple complex. Three large platforms and structures provided ample space for ceremonies on its summit. Both huacas, which is a generic Peruvian term for a monumental ceremonial structure, were built of adobe bricks, which were apparently manufactured and set in place by massive workforces organized by town, clan, or some other significant social segment. Construction techniques show that each section of the mounds was the responsibility of a single segment, and the bricks in a particular section are all stamped with the same maker's mark, indicating that they were manufactured together. Evidence also suggests a similar level of organization in the agricultural fields surrounding Cerro Blanco, so it is clear that the Moche government held great influence over its citizenry and had the bureaucratic wherewithal to govern effectively. The artifacts that the Moche are most known for, however, are not their huacas, but their ceramics. Moche ceramics, produced in huge numbers and apparently exported throughout northern Peru, are some of the finest produced anywhere in the world. All of them are highly artistic and reflect a carefully controlled, elite-sponsored iconographic vocabulary that supported elite rule. Two kinds of ceramic dominate the collection. The first are vessels and jars made into three-dimensional sculptures of humans or animal subjects, including the famous portrait pots that appear to be portraits of individual moche rulers. The second kind of ceramic are jars painted with elaborate and specific mythological scenes. Christopher Donnan, a scholar most associated with these images, argues that after A.D. 300, every painted moche jar depicted one of only about two dozen mythological scenes. These scenes were highly standardized, representing an unchanging cast of characters that interacted with one another across several themes. All of the themes represent, according to Donnan, mythological themes of good and evil, of warfare, and the establishment of the ruling order. Overall, they create a coherent body of propaganda promoting the ruling elite and their regime. In a non-literate society, these ceramic images must have been the next best thing to a published manifesto. Furthermore, we know that these scenes were not just mythological events with little relevance to contemporary politics. In several places, the most spectacular of which was Huaca Sipan, archaeologists have excavated undisturbed royal tombs whose occupants were clearly outfitted in the same ceremonial garb depicted on Moche pottery. Not only were these images of the Moche mythological past, they were images of regular Moche ceremonies, reminders of the things that the elite did every day to protect their followers. The various iconographic themes of Moche art frequently center around the capture of captives and their sacrifice. This has led some scholars to question how centralized and integrated the Moche civilization was. If all Moche were united under one government, then warfare should have been comparatively rare. On the other hand, if Moche cities were largely independent of one another and simply united under a single ruling ideology rather than a single government, warfare might have been quite common. Right now the jury is still out on the debate, though some scholars do think a long period of Moche peace, the Pax Moche, dominated the region from A.D. 100 to 600. During the early intermediate period, the southern Peruvian coast was the center of the Nazca culture, from about 200 B.C. to A.D. 600. The Nazca culture is celebrated in the archaeological cir circles for its elaborate ceramics, its masterful textiles, and its geoglyphs. Outside of archaeology, the geoglyphs are by far the best known feature. Before we get to them, however, let's look quickly at Cahuachi, the so-called capital of the Nazca people. I say so-called because it is by no means certain that the Nazca culture was ever unified as a single state. Cahuachi seems like a good candidate for a capital, 
40 large mounds scattered widely across about 150 hectares of land. The largest, called the Great Temple, stands 20 meters high. However, the mounds are all constructed in a very simple manner by piling up trash and dirt on low natural hills, then enclosing everything in an adobe wall. Also, the site appears not to have had much of a resident population. A better explanation of the Nazca people would be that they were a loose confederation of mostly egalitarian tribes. Each tribe had its own mound at Kahuachi for ritual purposes, but most of the population lived dispersed in smaller farming villages. But those farmers would have been the ones primarily engaged in constructing geoglyphs. Geoglyphs are monumental images made on the Earth's surface by removing upper layers of soil and gravel to reveal a differently colored layer below. They've been made by cultures around the world and throughout history, but the Nazca peoples of the early intermediate period really devoted themselves to this task. There are two basic kinds of geoglyph. Those made on the sides of mountains that are visible from far away across the flat Nazca plain, and those made on the flat surface of the plain and only visible in their entirety from above. Those on the plain itself tend to be long, narrow lines that apparently served as pathways for ceremonial processions, a type of communal rite that was more or less universal among Peruvian cultures. Scholars have mapped about 1,300 kilometers of such paths, some straight lines running for 20 kilometers, from one random point on the plain to another. The purpose of these paths was in the journey, not in the destination. Of course, the most famous of the geoglyphs are the three dozen or so that depict animals. Contrary to the opinions of some, these were not messages to aliens so much as, perhaps, messages to the gods. And again, contrary to people on this so-called History Channel, their construction with simple ropes and stakes would be quite easy. No need for an alien spacecraft to lift engineers into the stratosphere. In fact, the ways that these lines crisscross and interrupt one another indicates that they were made quickly, used, then largely forgotten about. It's possible that modern scholars are giving much more attention to the geoglyphs than the Nazca themselves did. Finally, I'd like to spend some time looking at the Lake Titicaca region. During the early intermediate period, one of the major powers of the next cultural period appears in the highlands around the lake, that is, Tiwanaku. The city was founded on the highland plains about 15 kilometers east of the lake itself, about 400 BC. Between AD 375 and 600, it expanded rapidly to become the dominant political force in the southern highlands, and during the middle horizon, from AD 600 to 1000, Tiwanaku's empire would dominate much of Andean civilization. It was between A.D. 375 and 600 that the city's major architecture was constructed, including the Akapana, the largest ceremonial platform, which served as the center of the imperial government in later periods. The Akapana is T-shaped, measuring 200 meters on a side, and rises 15 meters high in six stages. Like all major highland architecture, it is constructed of carefully cut masonry blocks. Another major feature of Tiwanaku architecture is the monumental gateways built at the entrances of many ceremonial precincts and covered in elaborate carvings. The most impressive of these are monolithic, carved from a single massive block of stone. The most important of those is the Gateway of the Sun, decorated with the Gateway God who is obviously the staff god of the Shavin peoples from centuries before and hundreds of miles north. Tiwanaku was able to become such a powerful state because it was blessed geographically. Lake Titicaca provided ample water for the city and its surrounding farmland, and large bodies of water lessened temperature fluctuations, making the weather more predictable and mild in the area. There's also much more open, relatively flat farmland in the area, and Tiwanaku agriculture was able to make use of ridged fields, irrigation canals, and terracing to increase its food supply, well beyond what other highland cultures were able to accomplish. Highland communities also had plenty of llamas that could be used as, be as beasts of burden in carrying supplies to and from the city. 
Thus, as the early intermediate period was ending, Tiwanaku was well situated to become the first great empire of the southern half of the Andes. Next week, we'll see how it realized those ambitions, as well as what happened to the north and the west. <laughs>